Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Why don't we, uh, today I'm going to talk about, we're going to continue on the series of uh, topic in faith. Uh, so why don't we turn to each other and believe in faith when you say this. Say, God will speak to me today. Amen. Um, can we start uh, the message with the word of God? And today's word, uh, if you all look at it, it's very short. So what we're going to do is we're going to read it two times. Jenny's going to read it two times. And third time, we will all read it together. Amen? Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Amen. Okay, can we read it all together this time? One, two, three. Amen. Now with that in mind, I want you to turn to one another again and say, God will speak to me today. Amen. For those who believe that, I believe, and you should firmly believe that God will speak to you. Amen? You know, I read on the news last Saturday that there was some YouTube online gamer. Uh, he's 18 years old. He was driving his McLaren 650S. It's a, I guess, fancy sports car. I think it's worth 300000 or up. I don't know exactly how much it is, but he was driving an 805 freeway on the wrong direction in 100 miles per hour and ended up colliding with just another vehicle and killing not only himself, but two other people, um, mother and a 12-year-old daughter. And we hear about this kind of uh, tragedies all the time. And you have to wonder, regardless how much money this 18-year-old kid made, but making a decision of purchasing a $300,000 sports car when he's 18, I don't know if that was a good decision, right? And I think um, we hear this kind of news all the time in a way. How many times do you hear teenagers or young adults going to some party and kind of randomly picking up, trying this party drug and that eventually kind of changed the course of their lives or somebody just making a wrong de decision, living their entire life with addiction, and that has a consequences. And I think chances are in different ways, I think we all experience something like this, that's something that we make one unwise decision that eventually leads to consequences that we all regret. I don't know about you guys, but I have plenty, right? And I'm sure you do too. And you know, the common, common thing that people say after they make this mistake is, they all say this, I wish I could turn back time. Right, I'm sure that 18 year old kid probably hopes that uh, he could turn back time making certain decisions. And scary thing about this unwise decision that leads to certain consequences is that not only it has an effect here in earth, but it has eternal consequences as well. What is the ultimate consequence that one could have, right? Is in this life, not accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and eventually spending eternally in heaven. And that's one of the reasons why as Christians, we need to go out and spread the good news. Amen? You know, our decisions can only not only bring about consequences in our lives, but it brings about the consequences in what? In our children's lives as well. Not only to our direct children, but generations to come. And we see this kind of illustration all the time in the Bible. There are too many to pick. But if we have to go through a few of them, David is a classic example. We all know the story about David and Bathsheba. Look what happened. Because of he lost it over someone else's wife, he eventually, his son, the baby dies. His other son raves other sister. And the other son, seeing that, kills his brother. And this continues, and this brother uh, who killed the other brother, he tries to take over the throne of his father's throne, and then he eventually gets killed himself. And when you think about this, all the consequences, the actions that lead to this kind of situation, it's a hefty price to pay for one decision that he made. 
one cheap thrill that he wanted to go after, and he had to pay the hefty price. How about Lot? Remember this guy? Abraham's nephew? Abraham, Abraham at the time, and Lot, they were really well-to-do at the time. They were very wealthy. So their flocks and herds and their tents, and they were so rich that the land that they were living in couldn't sustain them anymore. So they both decided to move forward and try to live separately, go separate ways. And Lot, as we all know, what did, we, what did he do? He chose the place called Sodom. And Sodom is it's really a beautiful place, kind of in a landscaping point of view. But the reason that choice that he made was so crucial was he knew, Lot knew, that place was evil. There were a lot of immoral behaviors going on in that city, even prior to Sodom actually moved out there. So he knew there are things going on that God would not approve, yet he made the decision to go there anyway without consulting with God. You know, I think when you think about it, I think Lot was a kind of guy who, uh, if given a choice, he would choose heaven over hell, right? I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, all of us Christians, we would choose heaven over hell, right? Right? Right. But I don't know if he would have chosen heaven over earth. Lot didn't. Lot didn't. So Lot ended up choosing, basing on his decisions, and we all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. There were wicked things going on in that place, and God eventually destroys and annihilates the city and the people who live there. But the person I really want to talk about today is not Lot nor David, but the person I want to talk about is this guy, Isaac's son. Not Jacob, but his brother, Esau. So who's Esau? Esau is the oldest son of Isaac, and we all know the story. And Jacob is a younger brother. We talk about Jacob so much, we rarely talk about Esau, right? Esau, for longest time, I don't know why, but um, I always had a sympathy towards Esau. Because I felt bad for this guy. I always thought that Jacob tricked Esau of getting his blessings. And Esau is known for what? He's really known for giving up his, all the birthrights for bowl of soup, right? And we all have understanding, yeah, Jacob tricked him, so he gave up a bowl of soup. And When you think about it, I mean, I changed my mind. I no longer have a sympathy towards Esau because I don't think he was tricked. I mean, this is nothing that you could get tricked about, right? I mean, if somebody would come to you and say, man, you look hungry, man, so let me give you a Big Mac only if you could give me a brand new Tesla. And, I mean, if you have to think about it, it, (laughs) it's not a trick. It's, It's really stupidity, right? I mean, it's... Esau's stupidity that led to a decision, I think Esau made this decision because he probably thought that the birthright was no big deal. That was his first bad decision, kind of ignoring the birthright that God has given, that his father has given, and taking that lightly and switching that for bowl of soup. Just imagine if you're heir of Samsung, right, that you're supposed to receive all these and you're willing to exchange that for a bowl of chunky soup. That is, that, that's really hard to imagine. And, you know, if you want to trick someone, you don't do that, do you? You don't do that. So it wasn't Jacob. It was Esau, Esau's decision. And when you look at Esau, this is, what, this is a guy that who, when you read on the Bible, this is a guy who really can't get anything right. You know, let me summarize it for you. He gives up the birthright to his brother for a bowl of soup. He gets duped out by his dad for all the blessings is to come. And now he feels bad and, he, you know, he cries and he remorses and he, it looks like he repents in a way. But we all know that he didn't repent truly. You know why? Because his actions show otherwise. When we read on the Bible, actions show that despite his father's specific instruction of not marrying the Canaanite woman, guess what he did? He married not only one, but two. To rectify the situation, guess what he did? He ended up marrying the third woman from Ishmael's 
family. We all remember Ishmael, right? First son of Abraham, father of Islam's religion right now. That was a big no-no at that time, but he did it anyway. Does it kind of sound like us where we cry and repent and nevertheless, it looks like there's a form of godliness, a form of repentance, yet we turn around that our actions show complete otherwise? That was Esau. And this was the beginning, I think, the, what uh, Esau did, uh, getting, getting together with Ishmael's third wife. I think this was the beginning of the alliance or union or partnership, whatever you want to call it, with Ishmael's family and Esau's family. And that decision eventually affects the situation all the way down for thousands of years and even to this point, this day today. Right? Even ISIS came from that route. And, um, you know, we know Esau settling in that land of Edom. We all know that. He settled in the land of Edom, and his people are known as Idiomites, right? Uh, Idiomites, they end up living there, and thousands of years, they've been doing a false worship and worshiping other gods and doing the things that shouldn't be done. What God has told them not to do, they kept on doing it. And the Bible teaches us that they were in constant conflict with God's chosen people. You know, think about it. Can you imagine your children, our generation of children, is in constant conflict with God's chosen people? That's a scary thing to think about, right? But that's exactly what idiomites were. That idiomite sounds awfully close to idiot. But, I mean, idiomites were in constant conflict with God's chosen people. And King Herod in New Testament is a classic example. You know, the guy who killed off all the babies two years and under, tried to get the baby Jesus? He was? Idiomite. And um, Esau's descendants for thousands of years, because of when you kind of go back to the original decision that Esau made, something that seemed so nonchalant, so casual. I don't think Esau knew what his decision would have brought thousands of years later. And at that time, he just took God's word lightly. That birthright is no big deal to me. My hunger is more important. That's what he did. And eventually, what about us? Even that 18-year-old guy, actually, when he purchased the car, I heard he was 17 because he was bragging about it, that what he bought. And when he was purchasing that car at, when he was 17 years old, paying three, dollars $400,000, I don't think he would have ever imagined that his action, his decision, would eventually lead to killing his own life and killing two other innocent people. So why do I spend all this time talking about these people, about making wrong decisions in life, when today's topic is about faith? There's a very close reason, important reason why I do. Because faith is a choice. Amen? Can we repeat all after me? Faith is a choice. Faith is a choice that you choose to make every each day. Every day. The choice that you make is the faith. Remember, as soon as we became a child of God, just imagine becoming a marathon runner. Right? We're all given a number in our chest that we all participate in the marathon. That some people, when the marathon begins, guess what? They run. They run hard according to how they were taught and trained. Some, they, walk, they, they run, but maybe not as fast as the other guy. But nevertheless, he runs hard according to best of his ability, according to how he was taught and trained. Some, they casually walk, disregarding what he was taught. He just goes off doing his own ways and eventually goes off course. But what about some? They don't even walk. They don't run. They just remain there and eventually sometimes giving up, going backwards. You know, just like the faith that we do in this walk, faith is a choice. So the reason I say this is faith you have nobody else to blame but who? But ourselves. You know, say, well, I don't want to do it, but I mean, I have no faith. Well, it's your fault. Because faith 
It's the choice that we make every day. You know, when I used to see people with faith, we have a lot of people with good faith in this church, and when I see them, I couldn't help but think about this all the time. I think God created them with special gift of faith. I held on to this belief for a very long time. And you know what? I no longer believe that. Or you could challenge it in the Bible and whatnot. I mean, it's debatable, but I personally don't believe it because God is a fair God, and God gave all of us the same amount of basic faith. And that's what Pastor taught us as well. God gave us the basic amount of the uh, same basic faith, and it is up to us what we're going to do with it, either to grow it or either to leave it or either to go backwards, just like those marathon runners. And just because you were faithful in the past, let's say eight years ago you are really faithful, four years ago you are really faithful, it doesn't mean that you're faithful now. And surely it doesn't guarantee you're going to be faithful in the future. Amen? Yesterday's faith is not today's faith. Why? Because we have to continue to make choices to build on your faith. And in retrospect, just because you didn't have good faith today doesn't mean you're not going to have a good faith tomorrow. You know, I think this is the type of thought that Satan would give us. And it's kind of hard to imagine, but did you know Satan, once upon a time, probably was faithful? Yeah? Satan was who? Was the angel Lucifer, right? He was the head of the praise team. So, it's kind of weird to think about it, but Satan and all these psychics, demons, they were praising God. So, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Once upon a time, they were praising God, but because of one decision... And we talked about a lot of different people right now. You talk about making a wrong decision. This, is guy's a, this guy is epitome of making a wrong decision, eventually not only causing himself of eternal damnation, but affecting billions of people who may have to spend eternal lives in hell. One decision. And I think the lesson that we need to remember is what? Have we... Praise God with all of our hearts before. Some of you did today. Some of you didn't today. But once upon a time, we praise God with our hearts. We praise God. We pray to Him sincerely. Just because we did so one time or in the past that I've been blessed or one night doesn't mean that faith is consistently present now. Amen? Faith, I truly don't believe faith is something that you have or you don't have. She has faith. She has no faith. I, I don't think it's something that you have or you don't have. Faith is a choice that you make. And uh, good news here today here is that if there's anybody who walked into this room thinking that I don't have faith, I lack faith, guess what? You could walk out of here with a lot of faith. You believe that? Amen? People who's been praying that I want more faith, if you decide to make a choice that I'm going to have faith, you will have faith. Faith is all about making a conscious choice to hope, trust, and rely on the Word of God. And then eventually, that Word of God will lead into action in our lives. The Word tells us to rely on the word itself, not on our emotions, not on our experiences, not on our feelings. That's faith. So faith is what? Faith is a choice. And what kind of choice? Choice of choosing the word of God instead of your emotions or your feelings or your experiences or whatever knowledge we think that we have. That's faith. You know, just hoping and trusting God, as many of you have done, it's not easy, right? You know why it's not easy? Trusting God. We all know. We all know in our head. We know too much in our heads. We know we need to trust God. We know we need to continue to hope. But you know why it's not easy? Because there is something that gets in our way, and that is our negative emotions, Negative thoughts, negative emotions 
that gets in our way. So what are these feelings? These feelings are feelings of doubt, feelings of fear, feelings of worry, feelings of disappointment, feelings of wanting to let go, give up. These are the type of negative feelings that eventually becomes an obstacle of you making a right decision. And guess what? If these kind of feelings continue, guess what's going to happen? You will get tired. You guys been tired? Are some of you guys tired today? Tired of your life, tired of your work, tired of your whatever? I'm not talking about type of tiredness that you get by working hard or not getting enough sleep or, I don't know, playing games or watching movies all night. I'm talking about type of tiredness that you continue to worry, you continue to fear, you continue to get caught up on your emotion, and it just drags you down. And I'm talking about that type of tiredness. And, you know, we do what we can as believers. What do we do? We try to be faithful, right? We try to be faithful. No, I got to hope. I got to continue to trust, and I'm going to be faithful. But when you continue to wait, a waiting could take toll on people's lives. Have you waited a long time and just kind of get, oh, gosh, how much longer, right? Waiting takes a toll in your life. That's why Bible calls it hope defer makes the heart sick. You know, but in the beginning, when some storms come in our lives, what do we do? We, we're strong, right? Especially IGM members. I've seen some of those guys. I, I have to marvel at their faith. And certain people who go through trials and difficulties and they stand up here and they have even stronger faith than before. And you know, where's that song? Wait up on the Lord, we will wait up on the Lord. Strength and rise, we will wait up on... And they're fired up. They're even more pumped up. Right? And we do this in the beginning for five months, seven months, nine months. And what about a year and a half, two years down the line? You know, you're just little, your passion has kind of cut down into half. But you're still hoping, you're still trusting, and you don't sing as passionately, you still believe. But three, four years down the line, guess what happens? You're just lip syncing, right? <laughs> about five, six years down the line, if you're continuously waiting, and nothing seems to happen with your own eyes, you're not even singing anymore. You're just singing in your head. Waiting, hope defer, makes the heart sick. Every time I wait for something and I'm tired of waiting, I think about Abraham. And this dude waited, what, 25 years after God promised him when he was 75 that you have a baby. And you know who tops him? Dude, Noah, Grandpa Noah, right? I mean, he waited 100 to 125 years. I mean, it's one thing to wait, but he's making an ark. Making an ark for 100 to 125 years after God's promise. And to me, every time I compare myself to Noah or Abraham, it doesn't really encourage me because there's so much gap. But guess what? Noah and Abraham himself, all they did was they all received the same basic faith as you did and I did. They just built on it, making one better choice after another. Choosing to choose faith and hold it, choosing a faith is choosing the Word of God. The promise in their case, because prior to the Bible was written, so they were holding on to the promise of God. Ears after ears. And eventually their faith became something that we can't even phantom. Amen? I believe that same faith that we could grow and build it like they did if we decide to choose, make the right choices every day. Amen? You know, living a life is tough, right? I don't know, maybe uh, living a life, I believe, is tough for everybody. You know, hurts and pain, suffering, these things are real, Right? Loneliness is real. Neglections are real. This pain that you can't handle is real in our lives. People go through that. We don't show it, but I bet 
many of you sitting in here are going through some of these pains in your life, even right now. These are real pains that we experience. It doesn't matter. It happens to little kids, teenagers. I never knew because I used to kind of disregard. I, kids are kids. Teenagers, I don't think they have all this. Trust me, they have it too. Kids, teenagers, young adults, mid-aged people, old people, everybody has these feelings. And they're real. They're really real in our lives. But you know what the good news is? The good news is in the midst of all these negative emotions that we experience in our lives, in the midst of that, God aids us and meets us in the midst of these problems. Amen? Isn't that a good news? But watch this now. That could only take place in faith. Not to everybody. The one who chooses, chooses to believe who, may, who chooses to make a right choice are the ones God is going to be with them. You know, when I go through um, hard times, I've been going through some times like all of you have as well. You know, I, I pray, I used to pray this a lot. You know what I used to pray? Lord, okay, it's one thing for me to go through the hard time right now, but at least let me understand why I'm going through it. And how much longer I need to go through it. And I know I'm going through hard times, but can you please show me just a little bit? Can you show me a little bit of what I'm going through and why I'm going through it? And how I should go through it? Let me see it. Let me see. That's what I used to pray. And I know I shouldn't pray like this. Oh, I know. I know I shouldn't pray like that, but I can't help it. Because that was what's in my heart. So I kept on praying, Lord, let me see it. I have a news for you. When things happen in our lives... When the storm is calm, the storm, storm comes in your life, you can't see anything. You can't see. You're not supposed to see. Let me uh, share the story that Brother Tom and I, many years ago, I think we we're 22 or 23, so that was many years ago. We went fishing uh, with about six, seven other friends. We went down to San Diego. We chartered a boat. We are supposed to go out overnight fishing, and we're excited. And when you're t- early 20s, Anything that you do, guess what? It's fun, right? But overnight fishing trip is very exciting. So we're all pumped up, and we drove down to San Diego, and we're about to get out. We met the captain of the boat, and he says, fellas, I'm sorry, man. I got a bad news for you. We won't be able to go out tonight. I said, why? Oh, there's a storm warning. So it just came. So I'm sorry. We got to cancel all this. Unfortunately, I can't give you the deposit back. That's mine. So what? What? <laughs> So what do you think we did? Okay, yes, sir. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll make a deposit some other time. No way, right? So we're arguing. We're threatening. And we're just doing anything and everything and telling them, hey, you know, that, that weather forecast stuff, then that's, that's never right. Back then, it wasn't that accurate like now. That was a long time ago. It wasn't that accurate. So we used to tell them, it's not going to happen. And so what if, uh, what if the uh, storm comes? It'll be fun. A thrill. No? We only live once. Come on, let's do it. Now I think about it. This is really dumb decisions, right? And this is the first dumb decision that we made. Trying to go out and persuade a captain to go out when there's a storm warning. So our second dumb decision came by, so nothing's working. So guess what we did? We ended up giving him more Money, right? So there's a saying, old saying that money talks and walks, right? Money talks. Something walks. And, you know, and, and the captain, believe it or not, he accepted the offer. He decided to go on. This is a second dumb This It's like a dumb and dumber, right? I mean, it's one thing to want to go out, but second time making a dumber decision or bribing this guy. But, you know, now I look back, the dumbest decision came from not me, not our friends, but I think the dumbest decision came from a captain accepting the money to go out, fully knowing there's going to be a storm. So, you know, we, we go out. We're all excited, you know, just we're singing, we're high-fiving, playing poker and drinking, getting drunk and talking a lot of nonsense that is not important and 
And we're just about three, four hours into the trip. You know, it's rain started falling and waves are getting higher. And guess what? Storm really did come. And you know what's really funny is now I look back, it's so funny. It's so funny to find out that we were so shocked that storm came. <laughs> hey, storm came. I'm like, everybody was trying to tell us that storm was coming. And we didn't believe it. We were shocked. It was like, <gasps> and this is one of those decisions, Esau, that we almost gave up our lives for night of fishing. So storm came, full on. How many of you have been in the middle of the sea and storm came? It's a scary stuff, I'm, I'm telling you. And it was so scary, some of the friends were crying. I'm not going to mention any names, but... <laughs> no, it wasn't Tom. <laughs> it was so scary. And you know what's funnier? In a bunch of these guys, we think, well, we're tough and macho and, you know, it's okay, it's okay. And I was one of them. Definitely, he was another guy who was acting all tough. But I know many of us were so scared, scared. And, you know, the, the galley area in the kitchen, I wanted to open it to see how bad it was. I opened it. The wind and the rain and all that was so scary. It sounded like the devil. Demons were crying. Never heard demon cry before. But if later on when they go to hell, I assume it's going to sound something like that. It was scary, right? And guess what? I wanted to see how bad it was. I couldn't see anything. Six, seven feet. I, I could see it from here to here, but... Anything beyond that, I can't see. I can't see. I can't even lift up my head. It was so bad, I can't see anything. The point of the story, when well, next morning, and you know, I, I got so scared, so I went to the state room, the place like a bedroom. I said, you know, if I'm going to die, might as well die sleeping. I can't handle this fear anymore. So I went down. I slept. I woke up next morning, and, you know, some of the friends were already fishing. And I remember thanking God, Lord. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I think we caught, I think, one small fish. I think one guy caught one small fish. We didn't care. I was happy because I didn't die. The point of this story here is that when you're in the storm, you can't see. You're not supposed to see. But when I go through the storm, I want to see. Lord, I want to see. Why can't you show me? I know you want me to rely on the word of God, but my emotion and my fear, everything just cries out. If you could just, you know, have you been to Korean sauna, right? If somebody tells you that you're going to be in there for unknown amount of time, you're going to die 40 seconds into the sauna, right? Only reason you could stay in there for 10 minutes is because, you know, 10 minutes later, you're going to come out. With our storms in our lives, there's no such thing. So you want to see, you want to know. And I used to complain, Lord, why are you asking me to hold on to faith when I don't have faith? Right? Give me something I have. And now I think about it, it's not like God didn't want to show us what we have to face. God doesn't show us because even if he shows us, we can't see anyway. So instead, he gave us something, another tool, like a night goggle vision, something that we could see in the pitch dark, like the soldiers wear in a, in a war. You know what that is? That's faith. Faith, we can't see with our eyes, but with faith, we could see. Amen? That's what God gave us. That's the tool God gave us to live this life. And... What is that faith? Like I said, God gave us the choice to make a right choice. And that night vision goggle, I believe, are his words. His words of God that instruct us what we need to see, how we need to handle the situation. You know, there may come a day that some of you, including young adults or older guys or whatnot, 
all of us will come a day that your back's going to be against the wall. You will. And when your back's against the wall, you try to get some help to the left, to the right, top and for bottom, east to the west, anywhere, and you can't find it. And I guarantee you, you won't find it. Yeah, you'll get some help here and there because you have loved ones, right? Friends and family help you here and there, but not enough to resolve the problem, the storm that you're facing. And you're going to feel completely left alone. And you feel in that situation, I'm telling you right now, because I looked at it from different angles, I tried different ways, I tried all kinds of options, I have a news for you. Only thing that you have and you will always have is the Word of God. Amen? That's all you have. That's all you have. When your back is against the Word, well, when your back is against the wall, that's all you have. And at that time, don't try to even look for other options. Our natural instinct is to look for other options. Right? My experience. What does the book say? Not the Bible. The other book. <laughs> other Christian books. What does that say? What does he say? What does she say? Useless. You know, advice is good, but not when you're in that moment. You're supposed to get good advices when things are okay. So you could prevent those kind of situations. You know, we, I think we need to come to the point to realize that the Word of God is all that we have and all that we need. And I think the people who realize is that from their guts to the point where it just stays there. We, are, we all know it in our head. Yeah, word that, the Word of God is all that we need and what we should hold on to. Who doesn't know that? Everybody knows it. But do you know it in your gut? To the point when you go through stuff, first thing that you reach out, it's not a phone, it's not a computer, it's not calling someone, is reaching out the Word of God. We have to get to the point in our lives of realizing in our gut that Word is all that we need. And some say, you know what though, I lack I lack faith, therefore, I can't read the Bible consistently because I don't have faith. You know, you got this backwards. It's not because you don't have faith, you can't read. It is you don't read, that's why you don't have faith. So I don't understand how people could turn it completely backwards, but it sort of makes sense, doesn't it? We don't have faith because we're not reading the Word. Amen? That's the choice that we need to make. So if you're in his words, you have faith. Faith, therefore, is word of God. And let's, I repeat this over and over again because I cannot emphasize enough. If you don't remember anything out of this sermon, none of the stories, remember faith is a choice and choice that we make is choosing the word of God. If you could just remember that, I think this is, I think I've done my job. Right? But the biggest obstacle of making a choice of faith is, I think I shared this before, is our negative feelings. It's our emotions. It's our feelings that get in our way of making that choice. You know, you hear people say this a lot. I used to say this a lot too and say, you know, when, when somebody has a hard time making a decision, I don't know if I should do this. I don't know if I should do that. You know what? When in doubt, go with your heart. We say that a lot, right? When in doubt. Go with your heart. You can't go wrong. You know, I think this is the worst advice that we could give to anybody. Because <laughs> Bible tells us our heart is wicked. So a wicked heart should not be reliable and should not be trusted. Yet, we say, go with your heart. When in doubt, trust your heart. No, don't trust your heart. Trust the word. Because if it's not reliable, why would we give that advice? I mean, unless you're debating either, I don't know if I'm going to have, uh, I don't know what to have for dinner, jjampong or jjajangmyeon, go with your heart, go with jjajangmyeon, right? I mean, go, do it, that's fine. But when you have problems, struggles that matters, that could change the course of your life, not only your life, but 
your children's lives or your group members' lives. We have to, we have to rely on the Word of God. You know, God urges us. He urges us to choose wisely. And he urges us to, I know what you're going through. And I know you want to see. Yet, you must choose and believe what I have told you. You know, choice is really, it's really simple. Either you walk in faith or walk in fear. Either walk in faith or you walk in bitterness. You walk in faith or you walk in like a time bomb harboring that anger. That choice is ours. We see some people walking around like this. I don't want to talk to them. (laughs) I don't want to talk to anybody who has bitterness, anger, literally expressing out of their face and out of their body. Right? But we do this without even knowing. Because we continue to choose over our emotions rather than what we feel. And, you know, people, I think there's a misconception of, you know, okay, if I have faith, then I should have all the, always peace, always happiness. And you know what? To certain people who's done this for a long time, yeah, that's the result. That's the fruit. Absolutely. But not all the time. Amen? So people say, well, you know what? I have faith and I have such peace. But with same problem, three days later, I don't have peace. So I must not have faith. I think the other three days ago, that must be a fake faith. No. You just continue to make a wise, same choice. Because the faith is not weighed based on how your emotion goes. Faith is weighed by the, what type of choices that you make every day. And fruit will eventually come. Amen? Believe that as you're listening to this, and I think when I ask somebody to, all of you to believe God is going to speak to me today, believe it. For those who believe, it will be answered. Amen? You know, if somebody would have asked me um, two years ago, let's say, hey, what, if you have any spiritual gift, what do you think is your gift? I think many people ask me that. And at that time, I used to always say, without a doubt, without a hesitation, oh, I know what my gift is. My gift is faith. I really thought for many years, I had strong faith. I really did. I I didn't say this to anybody, but I really thought I had bigger faith than any one of you. (laughs) You talk about arrogance. Now, after going through some stuff, I look back and analyze what type of faith I have. And I'm not saying this just to say it. If there's a basic amount of faith, my faith, I I was shocked how little of faith I had all these years. How could I be that off? It's one thing to be A off or a little bit off. I was way off. And, you know, things happen to everybody, to believers, non-believers, good-looking people, not so good-looking people, you know, rich people, poor people, thin or skinny people, thin or skinny, that same thing. But you, you get the message. It happens to everybody. But it happens to everybody. But don't try to figure out why these things are happening because it's useless. It doesn't help you to figure out what is happening because God's a sovereign God. Sometimes he does what he does. He's a sovereign. God is a sovereign God. He does what he wishes, what he chooses. All we need to know that he does not make any mistakes. So if he doesn't make any mistakes, guess what? We're in a good place. He's allowing things to happen. You know, Satan may try to steal a lot of things from us. And trust me, living this life, I've lost so many things because I got tricked by Satan. I made wrong choices. Satan stole a lot of stuff from me. But one thing that we should guard it with more than our life is don't let Satan steal the word of God from you. Amen? 
Because that's all we have. You know, I believe God. I know you do too. And because I believe in God, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe His power and authority. And I believe I'm in the promise process. Though there are circumstances that I don't understand that I can't see, I just don't get it, but I still believe I'm in the process. And guess what? So are you. You are in the process. Regardless how well or bad or uh, you're doing in your life right now, all of us are in the process of plan of God. Amen? And God says, I will work in your life. And he that who promises to work in our life says, I will work in your life until there's, there's, there's a second coming of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ hasn't come yet. That means he's still working on all of us. That's a comfort. That's a promise. That's the word of God that we shall hold on to. Amen? We need to believe this process. And God says, you are my child for his children. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us. He will never fail us. And he, nothing for his children will separate us from God. That means, guess what? God's already in our lives right now. And you know, for that, we should praise him. Amen. We should thank Him, not after we get blessed, but in order to get blessed. But we should praise Him wherever you are in your life right now. Praise God. Give Him honor. You know, I think God just wants us to be patient. You know, God just wants us to be patient. You know, when Pastor gave me about 11 days ago, he told me, Mike, you should uh, share the message. I said, yes, sir. And this time, though, uh, don't pick your own topic. I'm going to give you the Bible verse. I say, okay. So next day, he texts me this Hebrew 11.1. 1, and I'm not shocked anymore because, you know, all the messages that I share are not some things that I share uh, because I've gone through it and I've experienced it. It's something that I struggle with at the moment. Faith is a topic that I've been struggling with. And for that, and I wasn't even shocked anymore. And, and as I was preparing, I was asking God, you know, Lord, you know I'm struggling with this topic right now in my life. So why would you give me topic that I'm struggling with right now, time after time? It seems like last three, four times I stood here, it's the same thing. He always gives me something I struggle with. And I say, Lord, Give me something so I could share something confidently that I do well. And, well, he, he didn't say anything. But, you know, I, I asked him, so, okay, Lord, if I'm going to stand here and give, preach about things that I don't do myself, I don't do well myself, you have to get my back. That's what I said. Lord, you have to get my back. Not only my back, you got to get my side, you got to get my top, you got to get my, you surround me, you protect me, don't make me look dumb up here, okay? Promise me you got me back, you promise me you got my back, and he doesn't say anything, and I was stubborn, no, promise me, promise me. <laughs> I know it's not funny to you, but it was really funny to me. And I kept saying, Lord, I need a confirmation. Give me some manifestation. I haven't seen it for a while. So give me something like a wow that is from you. Nothing. And one morning, I was doing a quiet time. All of a sudden, out of nowhere. This one lecture I heard from one of you. In fact, it was Susan Jipsanin. The topic was in what does Christianity have to do with me? This lecture was from, oh my gosh. Eight, nine years ago, in my idea, I don't remember anything that she said except there's one sentence that she that said that just popped into my mind. How? Why? I didn't even know she gave that lecture until that thing popped into my mind. And it was, she said something about if God never gives me anything, 
If God never allows anything else to happen in my life, if God never answers my prayer again, he did enough. It's not word to word, but she says something in that line. And when I heard that, it's not like I got totally blessed. I'm like, I got totally annoyed. It's like, God. You know, you know when you feel like you have a pretty good argument against God? Say, Lord, you know, I've been patient, you know, I've been persevering, and I'm in your words, and yeah, and, but, and, but Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm flesh. I'm si- I'm in si- I can't wait till I'm done with this flesh, so I don't need to sin anymore, okay? Don't you, right? And, you know, I can't help it. So give me some confirmation. Yet yeah, God gives me something like this. If I don't answer anything else, he did enough. But as I was holding on to that, just kind of, it would just pop into my mind day after day, day after day, for three days in a row. Then it eventually came in my heart. He's right. He's done enough. It reminded me how much I received. I think Stephen said something like that in the beginning today. I remember how much I received because of God. And he reminded me all at once. It wasn't like one by one. All at once as if it come in. Realizing, making me realize what many miracles that I've experienced because of God. And it automatically gave me a heart. Even if my business, project that I'm working, doesn't come to fruition. He did enough. Even if I can't stand in front of people and show everybody, look what God did to me. Even if that doesn't come to fruition, he did enough. Even if he doesn't hear my personal prayers that I have, he did enough. He did enough because what he has already done for me and my family established the relationship with him. And God keep on reminding me there's nothing that will separate you from my love. You know, God has done enough for me and God has done enough. You know, because God loved us first, we're able to love God. Because we're not supposed to be here if it wasn't for God. And when I remember all the testimonies that I know many of your testimonies, and when you really listen to your testimonies, did you know these are all miracles, right? And it just doesn't make sense. You know, you listen to some of the these testimonies, it really doesn't make sense. We're like, how? What? Really? How many do we have that here, right? Not in my life, not only in your life, in all of our lives. And I keep hearing these miracles after miracles, and it just doesn't make sense. And God took us out of the Marie clay, and it's just complete nothing short of a miracle. Yet, upon seeing and experiencing miracle after miracle, I just can't, I just don't get it how I go back to my feelings, emotions, knowledge, where I feel, where I think. And rely on that. And not believing what God promises. Lazarus in the Bible was dead for four days. And Mary and Martha asked Jesus to come and heal him. And I don't think in the beginning, Mary and Martha was nervous at all. Nah. Lazarus probably got really sick. And Mary, I could assume, and looking at him and said, don't worry. We got Jesus. (laughs) Right? Because what did Mary and Martha do? They witnessed all the miracles that Jesus has done. And they were, they were tight with Jesus. They're inner circle group. They not only seen the miracles, they know for sure Jesus could heal him. All they needed to do, have Mary and Martha uh, to invite Jesus to come over and heal Jesus. One word, that's it. So I assume in the beginning, they were pretty confident. Like us. When we go through struggles in the beginning, how are we? We're pretty confident that Jesus, through prayer, he will will take care of us. And Mary and Martha, they were waiting and waiting and waiting and 
wait upon the Lord, we'll wait upon, and he wouldn't come. And Jesus kicking back and just kind of slowly comes four days after he's dead. <laughs> and Mary, Mary got a little bit just so, she ummed it up to Jesus, right? And she, she, he goes, she goes, if you would only came a little earlier, he would be living right now. Guess what happened? Mary started having this little attitude. Little attitude. And ended up being bitterness. You know, lack of faith. Lack of faith, eventually, what lack of faith does, it affects, the, affects our attitude. It affects our attitude. And when our attitude is affected, then it messes up our judgment. And we all know the story. Jesus heals him. Jesus heals him. Just like Jesus healed, raised Lazarus from the dead, he will heal every single one of us. From Mary and Martha's perspective, they thought last game was over. Why? Because Lazarus was dead. Was dead. So they thought game was over. Same thing with us. A lot of times we give up because in our minds, it's done. But just as Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he will raise all of us from our situation. And when you think about how it happened, it's because it was all miracle that God has shown, not only in Lazarus, but in all our lives. We need to go back to our basics. We have to remember what God has done in our lives. Remember, it was nothing short of a miracle, the reason why we're here. And if we continue to hold on to that, making a right choice, I believe that God will raise us from our situation. And the battle that we're fighting is not our battles to fight. It's God's battle. And, you know, Israelites, there's nowhere in the Bible that Israelites won any battle on their own. It was all because God intervened on every single battle. It is the reason why, reason behind Israelites won all the battle. Same thing, without God's intervention, there's no battle that we can win. I think there's constantly two ideas going on in our heads. Number one, we know that I need to hold on to the word of God, that I need to live by a word. And second, it's relying on your experience and our emotions. And if we continue to rely on that emotions, eventually the worries and fears and discouragements, that eventually leads to bad judgment. And eventually that leads to the bitterness. And once bitterness comes into our hearts, that's, that's like a red light. That's a warning sign. You know, that's why in Hebrews 12, 5, it says, let me read it to you. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. How often do you trust in your emotions or circumstances rather than trusting what God promises through his words? You know, did you know bitterness doesn't always come from what happened? But bitterness comes from what didn't happen. So waiting may take toll on us. Waiting could make our hearts sick. But regardless what it seems like, we have to make faithful choice. That faithful choice is holding on to the word of God. And therefore, faith is what? Faith is word of God in my opinion. So when somebody asks you, come, I used to have a very hard time explaining. If somebody come to me and say, hey, Mike, I know you've been doing this church stuff a while. So what is faith? And guess what? I couldn't answer. I was showing all kinds of examples. But I couldn't say in one word what faith was. But I think confidently I could say, faith is a word of God. Amen? You know, I want to tell you this story before I end. A couple of days ago, my older son, Russell, he, he came to me and said, I have English homework in six words that he's supposed to describe who he is, what he's striving for, and basically what his goal is. All this in six words. And I say, okay, what you, would you come up with? And he said, hey, Dad, how about this? Relentlessly running for a relentless Relentlessly running 
for a highest calling. And I said, you have a calling? <laughs> I said, well, not that kind of calling. I don't think he meant God's calling. But regardless what the goal, our goal is all different. Our, our drive and our passion, it's all different. But whatever it is, and I said, wow, that sounds pretty good. You know what? Forget your homework. Let me buy that from you. <laughs> right? Let me buy that model from you. In fact, I was thinking about it. That sounds pretty good. I want to make that as our family model. Relentlessly running for highest calling. And I think about it more and more. And I, God convicted me. Even though Russell, he's going to probably hate me for this. But share this with our members. Share this. We should relentlessly run for God's highest calling. And may our heart choose not to live by our emotions or the things of the circumstances, but live by faith of making a right choice, the choice of choosing the word of God for God's, relentlessly running for God's highest calling. Amen? Now, before we end, can we all pick up the program and read the Bible verse together one time? Let's read it. In count of three. One, two, three. Now, try this. I say faith is a choice, and the choice should be word of God. I want you to take the word faith out and replace word of God. And let's read it again. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your message. Thank you for your teaching, letting us know that faith is our choice, the choice that we make every day. Lord, we're so weak, we're so limited that we end up going, making choices based on our feelings, our emotions, and our circumstances. But Father, may we remember, may we remember to hold on to your word and make a choice, choice of choosing your word, living by your word, even though we cannot see. May we see things through the faith that you have given me, given every single one of us. I want to thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.